The Bible, and in particular the book of Daniel, provides assurance that God is in control and is working through current events happening around us to fulfill his purpose. I trust and pray that these stories and prophecies of Daniel will remind us that we serve a God in whose hands our future is secure. My name is Gary Kent from The Incredible Journey and welcome to our friends in the British Isles. Two thousand six hundred years ago, a remarkable scene played out on the plains of Jura, right near ancient Babylon. An enormous golden statue of the most powerful king on the planet had been set up, and thousands of representatives from across his empire were invited to pay homage to it in a splendid ceremony. But when the vast assembly on the plain bowed down to the ground toward the image, Three young men remained standing. They were quite conspicuous and really stood out from the crowd around them that had bowed down. Those young men had made a decision, an exceedingly dangerous decision. In fact, it placed their lives in imminent danger. Their decision angered a king and shook an empire. Who were these three young men? Why did they risk their lives? And why is their decision relevant to us today. You'll want to stay tuned to find out because these young men had discovered something very special that enabled them to stand against the crowd that may just be relevant to us today in the tumultuous times that we're living in. The three young men who remained standing on the plain of Jura 2,600 years ago were Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego. They were young Jews who'd been carried captive from Israel in 605 BC and were being trained to help govern the vast Babylonian Empire. The three were required to appear before this huge 30 meter high gold statue along with representatives from every nation and tribe under the great King Nebuchadnezzar's control. There were people present from right across the Babylonian Empire. They were all there to pay allegiance to the great King. Suddenly, trumpets sounded and the King's herald made an announcement in a loud voice that rang out over the plain. His words are recorded in Daniel chapter 3, verses 4 to 6. It's amazing. Listen to this. This is what you are commanded to do, O people, nations, and men of every language. As soon as you hear the sound of the horn, the flute, the zither, the lyre, the harp, the pipes, and all kinds of music, you must fall down and worship the image of gold that King Nebuchadnezzar has set up. Whoever does not fall down and worship will immediately be thrown into a blazing furnace. Nebuchadnezzar didn't just want loyal subjects. He wanted allegiance, the kind that would fall down and worship. And so the three Hebrews, who'd been taught since childhood that there was only one being, their God Jehovah, worthy of people's worship, had to make a hard, a difficult, a tough choice, a life-threatening choice. Would they go along with everybody else? Would they follow the crowd? Would they bow down to a counterfeit image, violating the commandments of their God? Well, that's an important question for us to consider in our day. It's important, especially because human nature hasn't changed since Daniel's time. We all want to go along with the crowd. It comes so easily and naturally, even if the crowd's wrong. 
We don't want to stand out and be conspicuous. We'd rather just follow along and go with the flow. However, there comes a time when those who follow God have to take a stand for right and be counted. We can't always flow with the crowd, no matter how tempting it may be to do so, because Daniel's sister book in the Bible, Revelation, predicts that God's people living during Earth's final crisis will face a similar type of situation. We're going to have to decide where our allegiance really lies. How will we survive during that time? Well, let's return to those three young men on the plains of Jura, because they had something that enabled them to stand against the crowd, something very special that will really help us when we have to take a stand. When the Royal Orchestra struck up its fanfare to King Nebuchadnezzar, everyone bowed on cue, everyone except Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego. They simply would not bow to this idol. Well, the king was outraged. Who could possibly interrupt his moment of glory? He had the men brought before him. But when he saw that they were three friends of Daniel, men whom he'd come to respect and like, he decided to give them another opportunity. Nebuchadnezzar pointed to the blazing furnaces which had been prepared for anyone who might make trouble. He knew that the young men had an allegiance to a God of their own, but he asked very pointedly, what God will be able to rescue you from my hand? Well, the answer these young men gave is justly famous and has inspired people everywhere. Let's read it again in Daniel chapter 3, verses 16 to 18. Nebuchadnezzar, we do not need to defend ourselves before you in this matter. If we are thrown into the blazing furnace, the God we serve is able to save us from it, and he will rescue us from your hand, O king. But even if he does not, we want you to know, O king, that we will not serve your gods or worship the image of gold you've set up. These men answered the proud king's challenge without hesitation. They did so by telling him that they fully trusted the God of heaven and earth. Yes, he could deliver them from the furnace no matter how hot Nebuchadnezzar made it. Their God was sovereign over all. He could do anything. That was the kind of God they served. I believe that we get a picture here of the kind of faith that will get us through the time of the end, whatever that time of the end may bring. These three young men had their eyes fixed on how great God is, not on how the fires were. When pressured, they didn't try to make excuses. They didn't try to squirm out of a tight spot. They took the opportunity to testify of God's power. And they did something else. They talked about their commitment to Him even if he chooses not to deliver us. Now, did you get that? They vowed they'd still be loyal to him even if they weren't delivered. They still wouldn't betray him. We will still worship him, they said, and him alone. You know, a weak faith won't get us through the rough times in life and certainly won't stand in the end times. If our faith depends on God always giving us what we want, on things going smoothly, then we've got our eyes fixed on the wrong things. A real faith is a relationship with God based on a belief that He really knows what's best for us. It involves a commitment to do what God asks, regardless of the circumstances. Let me tell you about one man who met adversity in the way these three Hebrews did, by testifying of his faith. On the 5th of July, 1940, the Eastern European country of Romania entered into an alliance with Nazi Germany and declared war on the Soviet Union. Romanian troops joined with the Nazi military machine on the 22nd of June, 1941, as part of Operation Barbarossa to create one huge Eastern Front. Under the German High Command, Romania 
provided equipment and oil to the troops on the Eastern Front. In fact, they committed more troops to the Eastern Front than all the other allies of Germany combined. But history tells us that Operation Barbarossa was a failure and the turning point in the fortunes of Nazi Germany and its allies. On the 23rd of August 1944, one million Russian troops entered Romania. The Russian army and the communist regime took control of the country. Soldiers, secret police and spies were everywhere. And atheism became the new chosen state religion. To believe and proclaim your belief in Jesus publicly was reason enough to be arrested. Church leaders now had a choice. Either be enlisted in the service of the Soviet party or go to jail. A well-respected Lutheran pastor, Nikolai Ionescu, known as Richard Wurmbrandt, began to organize a Christian ministry to his fellow Romanian countrymen and to the Red Army soldiers. And when the communist government attempted to control the churches, he immediately began what became known as underground churches. It soon became a time of persecution for anyone who spoke out against the government and had a belief in God. A large Congress was held with the purpose of showing that the different religions in the country of Romania were loyal to the Communist Party and its ideologies. One by one, the various religious leaders announced their loyalty and allegiance to the Communist regime. At the Congress, Richard Wurmbrandt stood up and publicly said that communism and Christianity were not compatible and announced the government's control of the churches. Richard was reported to the secret police and was arrested on the 29th of February, 1948, while on his way to church services. He was imprisoned for eight and a half years and during that time, spent three years in solitary confinement underground. He could not tell day from night and kept his sanity by remembering Bible passages. It's an inspiring story of how he survived additional prison sentences and a total of 14 years in a communist prison, was tortured and beaten by the guards and yet kept his faith. Here is part of his story. Two men confronted each other in a Romanian prison around 1950. One was a self-assured, intelligent, tough young lieutenant named Gresu. He was a dedicated communist who thought he was making a better world. The other was a young Lutheran pastor by the name of Richard Wurmbrandt. He was weak and pale. On his face were the heavy shadows of a man who'd endured torture and deprivation. Gresu sat at a desk with a rubber truncheon in his hand. He'd been interrogating the pastor. On this morning, he shouted, your story was lies. He was angry that the pastor had not given him the names of his associates and of his connections with the West. Gresu pushed back his chair and shouted, enough, here's some paper. We know that you've been communicating in code with the other prisoners. Now we know exactly what each of them said. The lieutenant cracked the truncheon on his desk and said, you have half an hour. I want you to write on that paper exactly what you've been talking about with your friends. Richard Wurmbrandt faced a terrible dilemma as he stared at the white piece of paper. He had to write a confession, yet he didn't want to reveal anything that might endanger his fellow prisoners. And almost anything he said could be twisted and turned into the evidence that he was a spy. Finally, this pastor decided to make a confession, a confession of his faith in Jesus Christ. He admitted that he'd been tapping a code on the cell walls, trying to communicate the good news about a savior. He testified in these words, I'm a disciple of Christ who's given us love for our enemies. I've never spoken anything against the communists. I understand them and I pray for their conversion. 
so that they will become my brothers in the faith. Lieutenant Gresu returned after half an hour, swinging his truncheon. He'd been beating prisoners. He picked up the paper and began to read. After a while, he put his truncheon aside. When he came to the end of the pastor's confession, he looked up with troubled eyes and said, Mr. Wurmbrand, why do you say you love me? This is one of your Christian commandments that nobody can keep. I couldn't love someone who shut me up for years alone and who starved me and beat me. The pastor replied, it's not a matter of keeping a commandment. When I became a Christian, it was as if I had been reborn with a new character which was full of love. For two hours, these two men talked earnestly about Christianity and Marxism. This young pastor took a stand in that prison of terror. He resisted by a positive confession, by proclaiming what he did believe. Those three Hebrews also wanted to proclaim what they believe. That is, not just to refuse to bow down to an idol, but to powerfully testify of their faith and confidence in God. And what was the result? Well, an enraged Nebuchadnezzar had his furnaces fired up to maximum and had the Hebrews thrown into the flames. Now, their example raises a question for us. Is our faith and trust in God strong enough that we would be able to stand up to such a test? Would we be able to exhibit the same spiritual courage that they showed? Are we sufficiently grounded in His Word and in our experience with Him that we too could stand before a king and declare that under no circumstances would we dishonour the God who loved us? These are relevant questions because sometime in the future, we may indeed have to face a test like this. For the present, however, our lives are confronted with lesser challenges. How we respond to these prepare us for greater tests. They indicate how we will respond when the larger issues arise. The Bible has a principle of spiritual life that applies here. You find it outlined in Luke chapter 16 and verse 10. Whosoever can be trusted with very little can also be trusted with much. The wear and tear of ordinary everyday life are directly related to the great challenges of life. God prepares us to meet the great trials of life in the everyday school of hard knocks. And here's another important point. We don't have to be afraid of the challenges we may face now or in the future. They can be an opportunity for us to see our Lord very close and very powerful. Do you know what these young men found in the furnace? They found none other than the Lord Jesus Christ. He was already there in the flames. He was standing with them in the flames of life. Christ is there. Nebuchadnezzar was astounded to see four men walking around in those flames. And the fourth man was like the Son of God. These young Hebrews had their eyes fixed on the great God. And in their hour of trial, they found that this great God had come to be with them. That's what an unconditional faith, a committed faith can do for us. It'll bring God close in the worst of times. Those three Hebrews in the fiery furnace made a life-changing impact on that haughty king, Nebuchadnezzar. He rushed up to the edge of the furnace and called them out. And as they emerged, the king approached them. He noticed that their hair wasn't even singed. Their robes were not scorched. They didn't even carry the smell of smoke. Ultimately, that fiery trial that the Hebrews went through only burned one thing, the ropes that bound them. It freed them from their bonds. Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego came out free. They came out conquerors. 
The trials of life can either leave you bitter or better. They can either strengthen your faith or destroy it. The difference is whether you focus upon Christ or the crisis. Through your tears and heartaches and disappointments, you too can see Christ. He's there in the flames of your life. Possibly your life has been torn apart by divorce. You may be going through a very painful family problem right now. Possibly you have severe health problems, or you may be facing a very serious financial crisis. Well, remember this, in the flames of life, He is there. Look through your tears, the understanding, compassionate Christ is there by your side to whisper words of encouragement. Nebuchadnezzar now realized that there was a God up there far bigger than he could ever be. He called the three Hebrews servants of the Most High God. Up to this point, the king had tried to be the Most High himself with his massive golden statue. But now he made a remarkable confession. We find it in Daniel chapter 3 and verse 28. Praise be to the God of Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego, who has sent his angel and rescued his servants. They trusted in him and defied the king's command and were willing to give up their lives rather than serve or worship any god except their own god. Nebuchadnezzar's rage had turned to admiration. The unconditional faith of the Hebrews had proved contagious. King Nebuchadnezzar and the thousands of Babylonian officials on the plain of Jura were brought face to face with the true God of heaven. You see, it's confessing our faith when times get hard that really has an impact. The faith that will stand in the end time is also the faith that will win others in the meantime. God will come close to those around us too. Richard Wurmbrandt, the pastor I told you about earlier, who made his confession of faith, had quite an impact on Lieutenant Gressu. After that first long talk, the lieutenant invited him back to his office almost every day, and they'd talk for about an hour. Pastor Wurmbrandt told him that the early believers were actually part of a revolutionary movement. Gressu was surprised to learn that Karl Marx had once written that Christianity is the ideal religion for the renewal of lives made wrecked by sin. To Gresu, this was shocking. As they continued to talk, Gresu was more and more impressed by the Christian ideals of love and service to everyone. Frequently he'd say, I was brought up an atheist and I'll never be anything else. But this pastor standing before him was an argument he could not refute. God was real. Two weeks after they'd begun their dialogue, Lieutenant Greshu realized he'd come to know and love Jesus and decided to receive Christ as his savior. What a scene it was there in that prison as the Lieutenant in his security police uniform knelt down beside Pastor Wurmbrandt in his patched prison rags and made his prayer of confession. When they arose to their feet, the two men were brothers. There's nothing quite as eloquent as faith in the flames. Wouldn't you like to have a faith like that? A totally committed faith? A faith that will stand tall when the times get tough? Well, it's available to each of us. God wants to develop this strong faith within you. Faith developed as we make Jesus and His Word the center of our lives is a faith that will stand the test of the end times. If you spend time with God, quality time communicating with Him, a committed faith will result. If you spend time looking at Jesus as your Savior and Lord, an unyielding faith will result. Let's decide ahead of time that we'll develop a relationship with God based on a real trust, a trust that He knows best, a trust that He'll see us through the end times. It's really rather simple. The three Hebrews 
didn't bow down to that golden image because they were already bowing to someone else. Would you like to bow your head with me right now, wherever you are, and say, Lord, I'm totally committing my life to you right now. Grant me the courage and faith to stand for you now and at the end time. Faith is a gift that only God can give. Why not ask Him for it right now as we pray? Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for giving us the example of the three young men in the fiery furnace. Thank you for your promise to stand by us as we face the fiery challenges of life. We want to trust you more completely today. Our aim is to please you and always stand true for you. Accept our commitment now in the name of our Saviour, Jesus Christ. Amen.